How to fix your go-to-market strategy. Welcome back to a fresh episode of BreakingB2B.com. I'm your host, Sam Dunning. And if you want to join thousands of legends enjoying my weekday emails, checking out past podcast episodes, or if you want to apply to work with us, head over to breakingb2b.com. So today, we're going to be diving into how exactly you can fix your GTM strategy. I'm going to be joined by Christopher Rapp, who's the CEO over our MRP. We're going to be talking about why so many B2B GTM strategies are subpar, are falling short, and not where they should be, what makes a solid go-to-market strategy, and some of the fundamentals. So if you're looking to ramp things up with your GTM, Perhaps you're thinking about ramping things up at your business, startup or established company. Give you some tricks and tips of what makes a solid strat. So with that, Chris, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Pumped. No worries, dude. Looking forward to the chat. Looking forward to your thoughts, opinions, strategies, and more, as I'm sure there'll be plenty. So with that in mind, why is it that so many go-to-market strategies that we're seeing, especially in the B2B tech space, service space, are not where companies want to be? Like, why are they falling short, do you believe, Chris? I mean, I think right now, a lot of strategies are falling short simply because the market has changed so significantly. Um, I mean, right. just in the past six to 12 months, uh, the, the landscape to go to market is just drastically different. There are less in-market buyers than ever. Uh, there are less, you know, budgets than ever, or when I say ever in the past four to six years, right? And the boom of what was 2019 to 2022 when interest rates are low and, and money was free created kind of a false, a false narrative or false sense of security when it comes to, uh, you know, actual go to market performance, right? So what's happened now is that uh, the market has, I'll say, corrected right to, to normal times and again i've been selling in this space since the early 2000s and right? so you know now that it's corrected back down a lot of go-to-market teams just don't know what to do they've never sold you know in an environment like this and you know everybody's just kind of struggling and kind of clawing to figure out exactly how to attack it mm. Yeah, so let's let's dissect that a bit. So there's less in market buyers. You're right, the market's changed, especially in the, the B2B tech sector, where funding is a lot more difficult to, to get a hold of than it was, say, three, four or so years back. So because of that, is that why there's less folks in market? Or what, what do you think is actually causing that that change? Um, I mean, yes, that that is, I believe, why there's less folks in market. Um, all companies, especially in B2B technology, right, have been forced to go lean and, and look mm. at really look at their, their profitability numbers, their costs, their spend, their churn rates, their burn rates, because they, they know that you just can't magically go out, you know, call a couple of VCs up and find your next, you know, 50 to 100 million dollars at a 10x valuation, right? So with that, with that internal, you know, let's call it lockdown, if you will, right, or push towards a more conservative spending approach. Uh, companies are simply just spending on less things, right? They're, they're focused on more of the absolutely have to haves and not a lot of the nice to haves. And um, when that happens, there's just, you know, less people buying new things than there have been in the past four or five years. And I think it's directly correlated to that, right? Um, um, also, you know, also, and again, that that is correlated to interest rates being higher, right? And the availability of quote unquote free or very cheap money to drive the growth of a lot of these companies is just not there. I see. I see. And is, is the logical answer here that because there's less folks in market, we just need to ramp up everything that we've been doing, like no matter what the strategy is, perhaps it was paid media, perhaps it was outbound sales, perhaps it was utilizing our network. Perhaps it was trade shows. Perhaps it was something else. Does it mean we just ramp up volumes, ramp up spend, and that's the cure? No. I mean, I think, first off, when I say less folks in market, I don't say, I mean, again, if you're looking at an aggregated trailing 20 years, this what we're seeing now is probably best correlated to the times between 2009 to 2000, 
17, right? So I call it normal, right? But then, you know, the 2018 to 2022 boom, right, created, again, I, I think an overcorrection on the upward side, right? So sure, there's less people in market right now than there have been over the past four or five years, but it's really the same as there were in probably the 10 to 12 years before. But to answer your question, um, no, right? The answer is not do more per se, right? It's not spend more, be more. It's really be more focused and and where it is that you're going to spend or what it is that you're going to invest in. Um, ensure that you are laser focused on it and your execution is flawless, right? I mean, I think right now go to market is almost a go to market success is almost exclusively about execution and less about strategy. I like it. And I want to dive into that a bit more shortly and we'll perhaps tee you up with a couple of examples, Chris, and you can share kind of what you believe is the best practice. But before we do, what do you believe, what are you seeing as some of the biggest mistakes when B2B companies are going to market? What are some of the big issues that you see out there? I mean, I think the, the biggest obvious mistake, and it's, it's not, a, I don't want to use the word mistake because it's something that's very hard to do, right? Mm. Is choosing, choosing the go-to-market motion that best fits your business, right? And again, it's tough to say mistake because, you know, that's the, the magic question, right? Um, you know, figuring out, are, am I product-led? Am I outbound-led? Mm. Are we inbound-led? Are we community-led, right? Are we partner or channel-led, right? These are big decisions, Right. And they're not easy ones to make. So I think the biggest miss that a lot of companies have in their go to market is a either choosing the wrong go to market or b pivoting away from their chosen go to market too quickly. And I really think it's more the latter than the previous. Right. Like once you once you've done the research and you've made that call, hey, we're going to we're going to be this. This is our primary go to market. Um, sticking that out and really fine tuning and pushing on it is really where a lot of the success happens, but too many companies, you know, are consistently pivoting go to markets. And to be candid, that's where most of the biggest mistakes I see happening in the space are happening. Right. As in that they're changing too quickly, i.e. they might have been product led growth and then they think they're going out like fully sales led and maybe just ramping up their outbound sales team and that kind of thing. Or yeah, well, it's yes, I'm too quickly, but more so not understanding what that what that pivot means, right? There are, there's a rare few, there's a rare few talented people who can manage multiple go-to-market functions across a revenue organization, right? There's a, a, a just a tiny percentage of humans who understand enough about inbound community partner, outbound, you know, all of the, you know, product led, all of the different nuances across those go-to-markets to just say, hey, we tried you know, product led for a year, I think we need to work on more of an inbound or outbound strategy, right? Because mostly your go to market motion is going to be really, really dependent on the talent that you have in house. And I think that's the biggest miss, right? People, folks think that I can take my current team and I can switch my motion. Whereas mm -hmm. you built that team with a skill set based on your previous motion or your chosen motion. And, and again, those generally your team does not have the talent or skill set to just magically switch right and if, if you have one of those one of the the tiny percentage of people who could do that then hey more power to you but most most outbound go to market specialists couldn't execute inbound right most inbound would have a difficult time on partner or re or channel led strategies most channel or partner led strategists would have a very difficult time executing on something like product led they're all very nuanced in the skill set and just just tactics tools um, and execution points across all of them are so very diverse that thinking your current team could pivot their motion is 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 a, is a pretty big miss so are we saying perhaps that companies should take more time in thinking about what go-to-market strategy they actually put in play before they put it in play, i.e. if we're going to go all in on a sales-led motion, hire a bunch of SDRs to hit the phones, email, LinkedIn, whatever whatever that strategy is, and kind of consider, is this the, the very best route before we invest all these resources? Because once we've got the resources in-house, if we decide to switch a year two years, 18 months, whatever down the line, and we're fully geared up for this strategy. 
I mean, we're almost hamstringing ourselves if we if we decide to jump boat, jump ship. You just, have to, you just have to know that changing that strategy is a six to twelve month process, right? It's mm -hmm. a, there's no click of that. Like so, when you make that decision on how we're going to go to market, understand that changing it, making a change to to that go forward, will take you six months to spin down and spin back up. Hmm. Are there any when you see when you see what you've seen from businesses, Chris, are there any key things? I mean, if you're a SaaS business, appreciate there's only a couple of routes that you can go. A lot of kind of products are just set up for product led growth, like you take Calendly, calendar kind of scheduling tools, that market, for example. Product led growth approach makes sense. It's easy easy for people to jump into a free trial. People then see if you're using the calendar sort tool, they see the logo at the bottom, whether that's revenue hero, whether that's another one. And they kind of get the impression that grows from that as well as their other channels. If you're something a bit more general, I don't know, maybe you're picking out, let's say, for example, a niche in the CRM space. Maybe you're building out a CRM specifically for, I don't know, B2B construction companies and you're picking quite a tight niche. How would you advise like those kind of companies pick out their go to market if they're in something that's that's a bit more unusual, a bit more specific? Are there certain considerations? you think companies should take before they say, look, we're going all in on this it's, route? I think it's really over, like too many over, really overcomplicated, right? Mm. Uh, a go-to-market strategy is really well done by thinking, where is my buyer? First off, who is my buyer? And really laser focusing on who my buyer is, what types of companies and what types of humans at those companies buy my products and services or have the highest propensity to, and where are they at? But that's really it, right? And then figuring out how to most cost effectively be where they're at, right? That's in its simplest form, that's go to market. So your so if your case is in your case, right? Construction CRM software, right? You know, understanding that probably most of your most of your buyers are in the field somewhere. They're not sitting at a laptop or a desktop. And you know, like so a free trial motion is probably very difficult for them, right? But you know, they might be, you know, you, you might have 25% of your, your buyers in, you know, a regional area that has X amount of billboards or something of that nature, right? So like, again, figuring out where to reach those decision makers most cost effectively is where you'll find the most success. Got it. And that makes sense, right? And I quite like that example because it's a bit different compared to some of the stuff we talk on the show where we're talking about, I don't know, MarTech, marketing technology solutions. And when you're selling that kind of software to marketers, you can quite easily say, well, LinkedIn's going to work because all marketers in the B2B tech space are hanging out on LinkedIn. So it's, it's quite straightforward or they're using Google search or they're asking communities or they're using this set channel. So I quite like this. As well, funny enough, I would, I would say that B2B marketers spend little to no time on LinkedIn, right? Oh, really? So I mean, if you look at, I mean, if you look at some, most of the, most of the folks from a, a persona perspective on LinkedIn, there's a lot of sellers, right? Obviously mm. they're there to, you know, for their, they're there for a specific reason, but a lot of sure. marketers are, they spend so much of their time marketing that like going to a social channel, like, is not just, isn't something that they do. Right. It's not, not something that's like, hey, I'm going to go hang here to do that. Right. So, if, I mean, look at again, I sell to primarily B2B demand gen growth and those types of decision makers. And if I were to pull up my sales navigator and look at the 12,000 followers I have in that space and look at their last login, I would tell you that 75 percent of them haven't logged in to LinkedIn in over 30 days. Interesting stat. So I, I like to be cooled up if, if I'm off base and uh, it, it sounds like I was, uh, maybe I'm just seeing too many uh, marketing technologists in my feed and that's thrown a bias. Yeah, it's, it happens, right? Like, I mean, the, who knows what you see on LinkedIn these days, they basically <laughs> magically choose what they want to show you, um, you know, <laughs> magically choose what they want to show you whenever they want to show you, you know, <laughs> let's, let's carry on this route. So let's, um, let's try and give some examples for the audience of, Kind of what's going to make we talked about some of the things that you should avoid we talked about the fact that you shouldn't be pivoting your your go-to-market too quickly when it comes to actually building out their strategy you shared chris kind of work out who your target client who your buyer actually is and 
work out where they're at. Let's dive into that a little bit more. So when it comes to kind of building that strategy out, can you share a bit more details about what you do in terms of kind of navigating that, setting those initial foundations up? Yeah, I mean, the the hard, I, I would say the hardest part of it is is identifying who your audience really is. It takes some time. It depends on the stage of your business as well, too. Um, but I think really laser focusing on you know the the who part, right? And then figuring out how to cost effectively kind of bring them into your communication scope. Those are the two things that I find most difficult, especially in a down economy. Most most revenue teams lean on trying to find people towards the quote unquote bottom of the funnel, right? Um, you know, but you know, really the it's it's really better to take a longer view or a longer play into getting people, I guess, earlier in the funnel, right? And then being able to influence them into, into revenue six, nine, 12, X months down when they actually decide to turn the key and say, hey, I'm ready to go, right? So I think identifying who and when is really the most difficult part of that equation. And I think there's a, there's a ton of different tactics to do it, um, but really most of it comes down to just analyzing either you're trailing win-loss rates across and, and matching those up with specific ICPs, seeing where you're winning the most, you know, mm. and, you know, from a graphic standpoint, industries, company sizes, those types of segments, mm. and then looking at who inside the unit, inside the those orgs is, 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 you know, becoming a close one with the highest propensity, right? And then, again, laser focusing on those folks, right? There's, I'm sure there's others who do buy, right? But in this in this space and in this economy and, and the go forward now, like it is, it is, is essential to be a master of, a, of a, a very, very few finite things versus trying to cover every base across your TAM or your go to market strategy. And again, I think that's a big miss. Too many revenue teams try to cover every base, but the reality is if you just do one really well, um, that will generally drive more results than doing seven things averagely. Got it. And when you say that, do you mean kind of one channel that you actually utilize to drive pipeline, to drive prospects through the door, as to say? Um, one channel, one tactic, one medium, one messaging, one, you know, there's there's like again, what across all of those different segments, right? If I'm if I'm a marketer, right, I you know, I have this conversation with my team all the time, right? Sometimes you have to sacrifice some stuff, right? Like, yeah. like right now, I for me, I'm like, hey, you know what? We're going to deprioritize SEO and blog content. I know we should do it. I understand. I get the value of it long term, but we don't have enough horses in the stable right now to drive everything. So right now we're going to focus our efforts on being, you know, having a, a great brand, having a great, you know, podcast and doing awesome outbound emails to our team, to our prospects. And again, those are just made up examples, but again, sure. You know, you can't do everything and really having leadership or having team members who are able to prioritize and let go of things that you may, sh may, may or may not should do for the sake of what you have to do, given, you know, the current landscape that you're in. So, again, if I'm if I'm a seller, I know I should probably do outbound email, phone and LinkedIn. But if I know that I'm not great at LinkedIn, right, but I know that I'm really great on phone or email, I can prioritize most of my time on what I'm great at versus trying to, you know, I guess you would say boil the ocean with multiple tactics. Got it. And is that what you think? If we're, let's say there's some marketers or founders tuning in uh, at startups, maybe they have got a small team. Maybe they're, maybe it's them. They've got one marketer. They've perhaps got one seller, one AE, and then maybe a, a couple of folks that are working on the product or building out the service. So they are very much lean company is is should we take the angle of where do our strengths lie like we know who our buyer is we know where, where they're hanging out um i've got a seller that's perhaps not as good as uh, email or social selling but i know he's, he's very good on the phone or she's very good on the phone and likewise i know that this is one killer channel for us as construction pros perhaps it's, i don't know perhaps it's trade shows or perhaps it's something else where that audience is hanging out so let's let's dive into that kind of full steam or yeah, it's, the play. you know, it's yes. Right. I mean, but it's also like, again, it goes back to where's my customer at, right? Like mm. 
if I was if I was in a go to market where I was selling to B two B marketers, um, I would not hire a cold caller, right? Who was a great cold caller or phone based person. B two B marketing folks don't generally pick up the phone. They're on a lot of meetings, and when they're off those meetings, they don't want to pick up the phone, right? I would I would I would focus on someone who's great on outbound email messaging and or inbound, right? If I was selling into sellers, right? Um, you know, VPs of sales or executives. I would hire a, a really talented phone person, right? Because I know that your propensity to connect with sales leaders because they just inherently pick up the phone more. They also mm. have an openness to cold calls because of the history of some of them actually doing the job. A really talented phoned seller is going to be significantly more valuable selling to that particular persona, right? So really, you know, the Figuring out what you're going to do great should not only be focused on what your team can do great, but also on what your what your buyer persona is most apt to engaging with. Makes sense. And I'm guessing a lot of this comes down to actual customer research. So running yeah. interviews with target prospect and knowing what channels they actually like to communicate on and actually use on a day to day. Try. I mean, it's trial and error. Right. I mean, there's trial and error. There's, I mean, some companies don't have the resources to go out and have a, wi a wide array of customer interviews. Right. I mean, you can do a bespoke five, seven, 10, 12 of them. Right. But is that a true indication of your audience as a whole? Right. It might just be the 10% who's a big fan of you and will tell you what you want to hear. So um, I, I think in the early stages of go to market, it's about doing a little bit of testing and, and kind of dropping your toes into waters with you know, very limited resources, maybe some fractional talent, maybe some consultant talent, maybe some, you know, before you actually decide to kind of jump in from there. But, you know, I think you know, it, when when folks say I'm looking for people with experience, right? Um, I think that's commonly misconstrued of, of somebody who's done something before, right? I've led a team before, I've, I've led a team of this size, or I've, I've done this, right? I think the experience comes from having innate knowledge of the buyer persona that you're looking to sell into, right? So that is, that's where I would focus on building my team at. It's not necessarily someone who's done something like, oh, I, I led a SaaS sales team. Right. Mm. Like SaaS ERP and SaaS marketing technology are two completely different cells. Not even close. They're both SaaS, but I wouldn't hire a SaaS ERP leader to run my my marketing tech SaaS platform because the buyer persona is completely different. Right. So find those folks who know your audience, who knows where they go, where they sit, how they think and, and where they're and, and kind of how they, they jive. And that that person will likely, you know, be a great resource for you to really scale your go to market. Yeah, that's smart. And I like quite like the take on testing things out, because as you say, customer research is solid. It's great. I mean, we've had experts like Ryan Paul Gibson on the show, who's kind of given a bit of a masterclass on B2B customer research. But you are right. That it's either not cheap if you hire outside agencies or consultants or it takes a lot of resource, right, to interview a ton of prospects actually get people up for interviews and then carrying that all out if you're going to do it internally yourself or hire a separate team you've either got to have that resource or cash so i suppose starting with the the most sensible route which is a lot of what you've been sharing really chris in terms of kind of working out where those people hang out how they're going to communicate and if you can onboard team members that have experience working with that persona i suppose it's only a, a quick quick way in yeah i think I mean, really, so much of it is just so, again, overcomplicated, right? I mean, I think, I, I don't know why we do it, but as humans, we find, you know, we feel like the, the need to, to, to really overcomplicate things and be over-reliant on, you know, data points that are very short-term lookbacks, right? I mean, I think to your point earlier, what's another common misconception of, you know, in, in misses and go-to-market strategy is that, looking at data points that are short term and, and looking like looking at them like they're trends and then making changes based on, you know, very short term data sets. I mean, the good news on revenue teams right now is that there's a lot of great tools out there, right? Gongs and, and all, you know, Clary's and all these, all these tools that can showcase really interesting statistical, you know, almost instant stats and analysis on, 
close weights, rent rates, all of that, right? But, you know, in the wrong hands, right? And somebody who, is, who, isn't, who doesn't understand trends across revenue teams and is really looking at simple data points, right? You know, there's, there could be a, an almost uh, like a too much pivoting, right? too, mm. much, too much change in focus, which drives your team. Basically, you end, up, you end up, you know, I guess, chasing rainbows, if you will, right? Like, you know, when, when the sales leader is reaching out to their team with, oh, this month we're focused on win rates. So oh, because that's what Gong says, or this week, we're, this month we're focused on, you know, prospecting because we need more ops because that's what Gong says. And, you know, like, so it feels like to your team that we're just constantly figuring shit out, right? Whereas, you know, choose the one, you know, the couple trending metrics that you know long term will drive the most return for the business and, and keep consistent with them and focused on the execution of them versus consistently changing that path. And that's, again, another key miss I've seen. I like that one. Is there any that you've seen that should be focused on? Like you say, a lot of folks could could constantly switch things. I we need to do more prospecting this month. We need to ramp more cash into, I don't know, paid search ads or we need to build out the content engine, fire up our podcast or build out more blog articles, whatever that may be. Are there any kind of key metrics you think these are just fundamentals that you should focus on? I, I think yeah. the, for me, the most important metric is opportunity creation, both by volume of opportunities created and total pipeline created from sub opportunities. Right? You're, you're, you're the most leading forward facing indicator is the amount of new opportunities popping up in your in your system, whether that's through if you're an inbound motion that comes from marketing and demand gen teams. If you're an outbound motion that's coming from your SDR team and your outbound flows. If you're a product led motion that's coming from, you know, new engagements with your freemium or your free trial, right? If you're a partner led motion, it's through additional, you know, partner engagements or growth on that side. That is the leading metric that if you don't do well, if you don't get ahead of it, there's almost nothing that can save you from it. You know, like right now, there's a lot of talk about win rates. Mm. Uh, you know, like my personal take is that I, I also like to focus on things that I know I can have the most control over. Right. And to be candid, win rates, while we'd love to think we have this amazing amount of magic control over them, there's so many factors in winning a deal that are outside of a seller or a revenue team's control. That focusing there is, is you know, again, can you get better there? Sure. But you can't control a company's budget freeze. You know, you can't control a company's delayed timing. You can't control a company's internal politics. You know, there's so many variables that happen um, that focusing on something like win rates, you know, generally, I, I just don't recommend. Whereas one thing that you can control is how many opportunities you're putting into the system, right? And, you know, basically how many at-bats, right? You can't, you're never going to really be able to control how many home runs you hit, Right, but you can generally control or at least have a high impact on how many at bats your team has. Yeah, it's a fair point. And like you say, in terms of what's actually closing this, there's there's so many things that can affect a closed deal in terms of get from initial conversation to that cl that cash in the bank, which could be that they're evaluating three or five vendors. And in, in the end, they actually went with the incumbent. They decided to stick with the devil they knew. Like there's so many outside factors that can fake, but I love the, the fact of kind of focusing on pipeline credit and would like to know your take, because I know a lot of people have different opinions on what actually counts as a, a qualified opportunity. And that's really, an, I mean, metrics in a, in a revenue organization, right? MQLs, SQLs, SQAs, MQAs, like, like there's 17,000. So apps. many. And the best, I, I can't remember where I read this online, but I read it on LinkedIn somewhere, right? An MQL is really just a contract between a marketing and a sales team, right? And basically it's a contract between the go-to-market team that we all agree that this lead is what we want it to be, right? And, and that in its simplest form is how I would define a qualified opportunity, right? So, so there has to be a, a very specific and a very uh, well thought out contract between whatever team is generating the lead and whatever team is following up on it, that this is exactly what we're going for. And then everybody has to be accountable for both sides of the equation, generating a lot of those and converting them on that side. Where the misses usually happen is that 
one team is quote unquote stronger politically in an organization than the others. They set some sort of expectation that, you know, we need more of these, you know, what's called an SQL, which is basically somebody willing to buy. Um, the weaker political organization inside a company doesn't have the internal gusto to say, hey, what you're asking for is impossible. Um, and then they end up settling with some sort of like, hey, I'll give it my best go. And then you're setting up the team to fail because, you know, let's call it the selling team is expecting 500, their definition, SQLs. The marketing team has, they know that there's no way in human existence that that's going to happen given the budgets and parameters that set in place. They do the best they can, and then they try to supplement their stats with, here's some other good things we're doing, right? And again, that's where, I guess you would say, blunders type happen, right? So like when you're going to market, you know, having a very clear, and I, I use the word contract because it's that important. Mm. Maybe it's something that you'd even, you should even consider having sign off of from both sides of the house, that this is exactly who we're going for. We believe it's realistic. Right. And I believe I can generate what you're looking for and you believe you can close it. And if you have that, it doesn't matter what you call it, an MQL, an SQL, an SQA, and you know, pick an acronym. If you have that locked and loaded, that's where most teams see the most success. Yeah, I think we're quite aligned on that, really. I don't think there is a need to mess about with so much different jargon between different types of pipeline and whatever you want to call it. I think that's quite a smart move agreeing internally what counts as a qualified opportunity. And once you've got those guidelines in place, then that's that. You don't need to mess around too much. Do you think that you should, organizations should be thinking about other opportunities, i.e., let's say, for example, a qualified op is someone that has a certain, is fits in a certain uh, company size, a certain job title, let's say they've, agree that they've got budget to work with us etc there's various other factors and points that will come into that and then if a prospect is it worth companies setting up different barriers that i suppose are earlier funnel i.e don't know ebook download signs up to newsletter comes through webinar that kind of stuff i suppose earlier stage opportunities yeah i mean i think it's really giving the customer what they want right i mean every piece of data says that in the modern buyer wants to spend 70% of its time doing its own research before they have an engagement with sales, right? So I think it's just figuring out what that 70% looks like. At what point have they done enough research that it's time to get an engagement with sales and then mm -hmm. figuring out that engagement. You're not necessarily disqualifying them, right? Um, you're really just figuring out at what point is the best time to, to, to use, again, tighter resources um, to push them for, to accelerate their path in the funnel, right? And again, that's different for every company, different for every market, different for every industry. But really that's what it comes down to is, you know, understanding, you know, when is the time to invest the resources that are more costly, right? And again, sales resources are usually the most expensive in the York, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, but also you have to find the line between, you know, pushing on the selling organization too that hey you have to do some work right this isn't just going to be a whole lot of layups yeah. um, we're ready to buy right you know so like that's the again and a lot of times that comes down to political capital right the, usually usually the seller or that the head of sales or revenue tends to hold the biggest stick right and they tend to push on the other the other you know customer experience marketing the other teams internally right under the guise of the customer or under the guise that this is what we need to be successful and i think it's important to have someone whether it be the ceo or somebody in the organization as a whole who holds that into check right and, and ensure that the selling organization is being held accountable for real for, for just being real right and not pushing on every every other division in the company to magically create the revenue for them i like it so i imagine this is this is quite a variable question but if you're selling something your solution is quite low ticket and quite a speedy quite a quick sales cycle i imagine knowing if your go-to-market strategy is working or not is probably fairly straightforward because you're building out the pipeline and deals are closing quite fast because what you're offering is quite low ticket quite transactional whereas if we go to 
more with mid market or even enterprise where deals can take six months plus to go from initial opportunity created to mm -hmm. close one revenue. How long do we give like a GTM strategy to know if it's actually going to be successful? Because it could be that we've got leads in the funnel, but we don't actually know if they're going to close because the deal cycle is so long. And then it could be by the time it's got to that six to eight month window where we're anticipating a close, like they've gone with the incumbent or they've done something else. So I suppose it's a it's a tricky question, but I'd like to know your thoughts. There are, I mean, there are trending indicators outside of just closed one, right? I mean, vol again, volume of deals in the pipeline is a key trending indicator versus just looking at total pipeline. Because what happens a lot of the time is companies will look at total pipeline as a key metric going forward, but that generally is skewed by one of two things. One, a couple of really, really large deals that are skewing that pipeline up um, or B, poor pipeline management or poor forecasting from a pipeline standpoint in whatever CRM that someone's using. But in the case of the first point, right, the total pipeline number is skewed by three or let's call it 10 percent. You know, 10 percent of the deals make up 70 percent of the total pipeline by by caught by actual revenue number, not not volume. So if one or two of those deals fall out, right, then that's when you start to see a quote unquote go to market strategy not work because it didn't turn into revenue at the clips that you thought, right? Whereas looking at volume of pipeline generated, right? And that's really just, and not just in total, that's just as far as what's out there, right? Doing an analysis on, on average right now for the next 12 months, how many companies do we expect to be in market for what we sell? How many of those are we capturing into our pipeline at a given time? And again, that's probably your most key market to know if your go-to-market strategy is working. Got it. Are there any tools or recommendations for people that aren't familiar with that kind of analysis level? Any recos that you've got on how people can do that? I mean, there's a, there's a couple different, I mean, it really depends on the market or industry that you work in, right? Like, you know, there's, there's triggers in most industries that showcase a propensity to buy. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, you know, some, with some, some folks, it's a, uh, um, with some folks, it's a, you know, like a, a new hire, if you will. Right. If somebody, mm -hmm. if somebody, if a new company hire, let's just as an example, if somebody hires a head of AI, right. Then chances are they're probably in market for AI technologies in the next six to 12 months. If somebody brings in a new, CMO or a new CFO or a new C something or a VP of something, chances are they're looking to reevaluate their tech stack in some form or fashion. So I would say that they have a higher propensity to engage in my solutions per that hire, right? There are just general industry trends, right? Like as an example, like, you know, some, some public or, you know, state institutions have RFP cycles that everyone knows happens. Right. You know, like, so there's a lot of data in some of those cases when RFPs are coming available based on timing and or, you know, publicly available information. Right. Um, and then there's just a lot of, uh, you know, good, what I call good information gathering from the outbound or inbound teams. Right. So any engagement you have with a potential customer, it's important not to just see if they're willing to take a call, but at least pull other information from that that might help you later. What, you know, if someone says, hey, I'm not interested right now, I'm using X vendor, right? Most sellers or most outbound or most anyone would just say, hey, thanks, cool. I'm going to go to the next call. But taking sure. three seconds to say, who are you using and when is your renewal up? And then capturing that data in your CRM so you have a forward-facing pipeline of renewal opportunities and or, you know, customer acquisition or takeover opportunities is another key, key facet as well. So it's tough to say. It's a pretty, you know, generally it's tough to say. I mean, I work in in B2B media and, and advertising. So my customers, in order to use my competitors, have to put something out there, right? So if I if I see that something out there, then I obviously know that that customer is in market over the next six to 12 months so I can focus my resources there, right? So it's, there's no like, ma I wish there was a magic board that did it, but there's just, it's just kind of figuring out in your space, what is a trigger, right? What is a trigger that you, that, that, you know that someone's either thinking about or getting ready to be in market and yep. then figuring out how do I collect those triggers and then attack them. Got it. Okay. I have, I have a customer in the, let's say the HR software space where they pay my call center just to reach out to HR people and ask them, what are they using? And when are they, when is their renewal up? That's it. 
no, we're not, there's no appointment setting that happens. There's no try to get some, I mean, obviously if someone says I'm looking right now, then we'll connect them. Right. But the purpose of them leveraging my outbound call center at MRP is just to collect that data because they know if they have, if they have data on a thousand, 2000, 3000 companies on what vendor they're currently using and when their renewal is up, they can attack their selling and marketing organization, not only at the right companies, but the right companies at the right time. And that's going to drive, you know, it's already, it's already driving a ton of positive ROI for them just because they have, again, every outbound reach that they have now that they've compiled enough data is seeing increased response rates because they're hitting people not only with great messaging, but also at the right time. Message plus timing. One of the, uh, one of the best approaches to sales or marketing, but also one of the most difficult. And I also appreciate the the cheeky plug of your own company. It's very subtle. I do. Like I, I'm... <laughs> timing, work, is that. timing is really everything. Messaging is, I don't want to say irrelevant. It's nice to have. It's like, you know, like, but again, at the end of the day, um, and I've said this many times before, a shitty email sent at a perfect time will outperform a wonderful email sent at the wrong time. And that'll happen a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's fair. It's fair. I can't, I can't argue with that. So, we talked about quite a lot about kind of fundamentals. We shared kind of an art example of the construction niche CRM about getting perhaps the first seller as an almost industry expert who knows the persona kind of inside out. So, they've got that unfair advantage for us and can kind of share where those target clients are going to be hanging out and the best way to break into those accounts and communicate with them. So as things ramp up, let's say that our motion that we've built out is working. In that situation, are we, do, are we doing more of the same or are there kind of considerations that we should perhaps bear in mind, Chris, as, as the company revenue scales up and as we realize we're onto something and we want to kind of build out the play? Are there kind of usually growth issues that you see with businesses or are there other things that we should consider before we just say, Let, let's put a load more cash and resource into doing more of, more of what we were doing before? It's it's a good question, right? Like there's there's different levels of scale that require yeah. different, you know, different attack plans, right? I think the instead of just doing more, I mean there, you can do more of the same, right? And get pretty big, right? Like like a, a singular go-to-market can can scale fairly large, obviously depending on your TAM and all of those other variables as well, too, right? But sure. I think another like a common misconception is in order to scale, we have to we have to diversify and do more, more different things, right? Which obviously more different things cost more money, right? And like those additional costs for unproven mechanisms generally don't end up being as, as fruitful if you just invested more into what you know you do really, really well, right? Like, so it's, the key is having the expert on your team who knows when you've tapped a resource, right? And a simple example, right? Um, you should spend all of your budget on maximizing paid search until you've maximized it, right? Like there's, those are the, from a, an intent perspective, someone who goes into Google and types in B2B, you know, HR software likely has the high in, highest intent to purchase of any vendor in the space. So you should focus a hundred percent of your resources on maximizing that channel until you've maximized it. So you have enough data that says, hey, we can't scale this anymore. There's only so much search. There's only so many people searching and there's only so much we can win competitively. We've we've taken that as far as it goes. OK, great. Mm -hmm. Once we've done that, what's our next what's the next the next attack point? And then you take that secondary attack point as far as it can go. Right. So most B2B or most revenue teams fail in that they try to do seven things well. Try to do a little bit of paid search. I try to do a little bit of social. I try to do a little bit of outbound. I'm trying, you know, I'm playing around with with some brand and some advertising. They might have a podcast, right? You're kind of, you know, you're again boiling the ocean trying to do everything at the same time. Whereas if you if you're singularly focused on on whatever channel, I mean, again, I I use the the Google search example, right? But that might not be the channel to exhaust if you're selling like robotic systems for warehouses, right? You know, if you're selling robotic systems for warehouses, then it might be micro events, right? And having individual demos of your little robot 
doing its thing, right? That mm -hmm. might be the channel that you need to exhaust. We cannot get any more people to, to watch our demos of our robot, right? Okay, now that we've maximized that, what's next? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, a lot of this, I think we're, we're a very similar mindset. I, I talk, preach about this stuff all the time in SEO when, when I talk about exhausting that target market that is raising their hand, that is quite literally searching for your offer now build out all those opportunities. So in our case, build out those bottom of the funnel pages on your website, exhaust that only then start looking at other tactics and strategies. And yours are the same way you gave the paid search example, or the robotic example. What is the no brainer that your prospects are doing? Could be Google, could be elsewhere. Where are they going? Where are they clicking? Where are they heading? Heading? Who are they asking? Where are they in when they're in market and they're, they're ready to speak to the salesperson? Exhaust that. And then think about other avenues because otherwise you're like you say spreading yourself too thin or spreading resources too thin or doing stuff that's kind of a waste of time really because you're not all in on it yeah it, and most don't like again that that word exhaust really means exhaust like take it to the limit where you know with a hundred percent certainty that there is nothing more that you could pull out of that tactic or that strategy then and only then do you move on to strategy or tactic number two nice I think that's a, a good way to wrap it up, Chris. So with that, I want to say thanks very much for coming on the show, sir. Enjoyed the chat. And sure. please do share more about how everyone tuning in can learn more about yourself, the company, and the best way to get in touch. Awesome. Yeah. So it means you can reach uh, me personally on LinkedIn at Christopher Rack. I also have a podcast um, on Spotify, uh, Apple iTunes called b to boring right? And that podcast, each week we talk to a B2B marketer um, talk a little bit about marketing, and then we ask them about a campaign or a program that they've ran in their career that was not boring. You know, generally looking to inspire our guests with ideas or creative solutions they might be able to take each and every week and pull from there. You can reach MRP at www.mrpfd.com um, or on our socials at um, MRP on generally LinkedIn, but we're also on Instagram and, and TikTok and a couple other places as well. So check us out. Check me out. Happy to connect with anybody from this group and, uh, you know, awesome. Cool, man. I will put all of those links in the show notes below. I appreciate you coming on. Awesome. Well, thank you again. I appreciate it. it was been, it's been fun. Good chats and, you know, happy to join anytime. No worries, dude. We've got to give a quick shout out to our sponsors of the show, Revenue Hero and Factors AI. And if you enjoyed the episodes, why not join thousands of legends enjoying our weekday newsletter, checking out past episodes, or if you want to apply to work with us, head over to breakingb2b.com. And a big thank you to you, the audience, for tuning in. Catch you on the next one for more no BS B2B marketing strategies to grow your business, grow your revenue. Catch you soon.